Well, for those of you that missed the Russell Morris, the real thing, I can't get it on again. So, can someone hum along <laughs> to it? I don't know why. It's just, oh, it's just disappeared. Okay, so um, I guess I was asked to do a lecture on Venice Biennale because I've been there a few times and I was there this year in June. But I thought, oh, I can't have a simple show and tell about the Venice Biennale and I, I sort of thought about it and I thought, I want to talk about this notion of the real. And this is why I played the Russell Morris uh, song, The Real Thing. And for those of you that know it, he does talk about the nuclear bomb, Nazis, Adolf Hitler, the rocket launch, Vietnam War, Nixon, Thatcher, Reagan, all that politics that um, really impacted on that generation of people. The song was first recorded in 1969 and um, Russell Morris responded to that context of the, 90, of the late 1960s with this song called The Real Thing. But I'm very interested in The Real Thing and um, while this lecture is not going to be about that kind of politics at all, the phrase itself, The Real Thing, is, and in fact I suppose the music and the tone and to some extent the poetics of those words and the atmosphere that they... Um, that they kind of produce is what the lecture is about. But I want to start with this sort of uh, claim uh, from, an, uh, uh, from the perspective of psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic theory, the real is impossible. Now, of course, everyone's going to sort of think, oh, what is that about? Psychoanalytic theory from Freud's Freud's Oedipal phase to Lacan's mirror stage, these are the two fathers of psychoanalytic theory, have argued that once the human subject enters the sphere of language, the world, time, that may have been whole before language, uh, complete and full because it was based on the satisfaction of needs, is disrupted. In fact, language causes a gap between that time and world of wholeness and then the rest of life that follows. And what psychoanalytic theory then propose is a three psychoanalytic orders, the symbolic, the real and the imaginary. And these are Jacques Lacan's orders. And they serve to situate each one of us, each one of us human subjects within a system of perception and a dialogue with the external world. The symbolic field is the world, is the field that's articulated, the field of language, the field of codes, systems, orders, um, networks, organization, in other words, uh, writing, and so forth. It involves the formation of order. Symbols, Lacan has argued, in fact envelop humans in a network so total that they join together before that human even enters the world. So there's already a world of networks that the subject, human subject, is inserted into. And the only reason we speak is because that system, in fact, has engendered us to speak. The imaginary or semiotic, as it sometimes is called, is related to the internalized image of the ideal, of that whole self that once is believed to have existed and is stirred by notions of coherence, in other words, unity and wholeness, rather than fragmentation. It is related often to the flow of images and memories but the danger of the imaginary, and I believe that we are in an era where we are in the imaginary with less and less symbolic realms, is the lure of the image, the seduction and the possibility of the human subject to fall for that phantasmatic projection of the imaginary. So from the point of... Uh, the entry into language, the human subject lives as a divided subject, and this is the core of psychoanalytic theory, between the symbolic and the imaginary, between language 
and the drive or desire for coherence. The real, however, is an era prior to this division, the impossible era, the era that does not really is not really part of the, the human subject once they enter language. It's a pre-imaginary or pre-symbolic uh, era. And more importantly, it resists representation. So you cannot live in the real. It is impossible. It is that aspect where words and images fail. Lacan stated that the primordial animal you know, needed things likened to the real, but as far as humans are concerned, the real is impossible. We cannot express it in either language or images because the very entrance into language marks our irrevocable separation from the, leave, uh, from the real. However, it is the drives, the desires, the enjoyments, the stuff of life. Now, various artists have um, tried to explore this. So like the human subject, once language is acquired, the world is always and only understood through language. The effort to discuss the world as a field of concrete things, in other words, buildings, chairs, floors, ceilings, uh, is only possible uh, as a discussion through language. It's the only media we have. Things and objects are seen, are experienced, a favourite for architects, the experience, but can only be perceived through a coded signifying system that depends on mutual understanding of words about things, experience. Um, artists like Magritte, and you can see the image here, Ceci Nepa and Pip, um, uh, have explored this gap in works of image and text, presenting the idea that the word is never equal to the thing itself. The word is a word, the thing is a thing. It is only by consensus, if we agree to it, that that is in fact a pipe. I could say it was a chair, and if we all agree to it, it would be a chair. Okay, so it's only by consensus that this thing is, is perceived as a pipe. And this is what um, Magritte tried to explore here. And that consensus is a symbolic process of coding and signification. This is why in post-structuralist phil philosophy, his image of the pipe has become the very currency that has uh, articulated what post-structuralism is, how language and the thing are never equal. Magritte, in fact, borrowed this image it is uh, suggested from Le Corbusier's book, Vers une architecture, since he was an admirer of the architect and, as he says, a painter. Um, but it also is inspired by other little signs in, in shop windows which said, Ceci n'est pas de l'art, this is not art. Um, and um, so this is what we have. We have these things and then we have language. So in Russell... And yet people search for the real. Russell Morris, the real thing, if you are, you know, of um, sort of my generation, or even if you're your generation, apparently the song is familiar. Um, the original repeats, even though it was um, recorded in 1969, current generation is familiar with that song. But also the phrase that is often mentioned in this school, in the real world, um, by students, of course, but also in an uncanny way by, by some academic staff. W what is university? The unreal world, the utopian world, the world that you will leave behind? What is the real world? This is partly why I want to explore this subject. And of course, the real lecture series, a very beautiful poetic play and resonance of the unreal of the real, in fact. So, what does this mean for the context of architecture? And so what I want to explore is this question through a discussion about the Venice Architecture Biennale um, and, and, and sort of touch on education design exhibition. The position here is that 
Um, in the context of architecture, the Venice Biennale goes the other way. It is not real. It is not architecture. It is not a thing, a building or an object. It is not architectural practice, the design and production of the city or building. It is not even a tour of real architecture. Architects do that by going on architectural tours or pilgrimages. Um, for example, in the 1930s, Australian architects went on the grand tour of Rome, Florence or Italy or the Acropolis. In the 1950s, they went to the Nordic countries. Recently, people have been going to Bilbao and Zumthor buildings. Um, interestingly, one of the most famous architects, Le Corbusier, uh, in 1911 went through the Balkans, my part of the world, and I recently gave a paper on the um, uh, impact of that tour on his architecture after that. He was 24 years old at the, at the time. But the Venice Architecture Biennale is an exhibition about architecture. You could not get more unreal than that. Of course, there are pavilions, real built structures, and I will present a couple, but these are structures within which the exhi exhibits are presented. Now, just briefly, uh, a little bit of an overview of the Biennale. Every two years, the global architecture community presents new ideas and ways of uh, understanding or um, making architecture at the Venice Biennale. I was fortunate to go to the 2010 as a member of the Architecture Australia media team. I was one of three people that then had to write a review um, of the Biennale for Architecture Australia. Um, this meant that I was invited to all the Australian events, uh, not only the exhibition opening, but brunch on the roof of somewhere, cocktails in the Peggy Guggenheim, and I don't know what else, but there was a lot of parties. Um, uh, pavilion openings, and this, is, uh, this is period is sort of before the Biennale opened, called the Vernissage. It was a bit of a buzz a very vibrant atmosphere, you were rubbing shoulders with star architects, you started to feel like you were part of the paparazzi. Um, it is easy to be cynical about the spectacle and extravaganza of the Venice Biennale. You know, when the paparazzi surrounded um, Sejima and Ishizawa in 2010 and the film director Wim Wenders, who did a film on them that was shown at the Biennale, you know, thoughts of Hollywood became real and visible. And yet this cynicism is a bit superficial because as an architectural community we have put value on Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion and Melnikov's Russian Pavilion produced in similar forums. I, after the 2010 Biennale, I wondered why I had not been to the Venice Biennale before. So it was a very exciting time. And just briefly, you can see the two black spots. That's where the architecture Biennale Exhibit, exhibits are. The bottom one is the Giardini um, and I can use the mouse. There we go. Um, and this one is the Arsenale that um, emerged later in the history of the Biennale. <coughs> and that's um, Venice. Now just a little bit of um, history. Uh, Interestingly, the Architecture Biennale started in 1980. And as we can see from, um, well, maybe this next slide, there's the one 1980 on the, on the left, and then um, a more recent one, 2006. And you can see that it started small. Italy won all the awards in 1980, and there was a couple of, you know, Western countries participating, whereas... In the new millennium, there's a vast area of um, nations and architects from very various parts of the world that participate in it. Um, and the Biennale, the Venice Architecture Biennale is every two years on the even year. Um, it is... Um, uh, um, an addition, if you like, 
to the Venice Art Biennale, which start, started in 1895. So the Venice Architecture Biennale was about 80, whatever, five years after the Venice Art Biennale. So in that sense, and, and it sort of um, before it started, I, I believe that Carlo Scarpa made some architectural artistic interventions in the Art Biennale um, and therefore there is a sort of, I, I guess, a flavour to the Venice Architecture Biennale, at least from its association with the Art Biennale and its kind of... Um, um, link to that history, that it's trying to um, align itself with architecture as some kind of artistic or cultural production, and it searches for the ways that architecture transcends its commercial agenda. Um, and certainly what we um, start to see is that... Um, there is a kind of a discourse that emerges out of the Venice Architecture Biennale that tries to talk about architecture. You know, this is what I mean by it's not the real thing. It's not like hitting, hitting your um, head against a brick wall. It's like talking about that brick wall. It's, it's a discourse on architecture in that sense. Um, and, of course... It's in Venice. Now, that's no accident in, in, in that sense. Venice is uh, already a place where millions of tourists go. And it, uh, however, was part of an agenda. The Venice Art Biennale was part of an agenda to, in, to generate artistic um, practice um, and to make that integral. And interestingly, it actually thrived during the fascist period of Italy. Um, so there was... Uh, Mussolini invested a lot into the Venice Art Biennale at the time in order to um, interact with um, culture and be seen to be interacting with culture. Um, <clears throat> Now, the Venice Architecture Biennale um, uh, because the architecture, the role of architecture in a sense, and this is the imaginary, real and symbolic orders, is in fact to protect society from the real and from the trauma of the real. Architecture is an ordering system. It organises space and spatiality from the amorphness of a field, anything and everything, into a coded, symbolic, structured set of delineations. So architecture is the kind of the discipline par excellence that tries to order and protect us from this awful trauma of the real. The most competent architecture provides a symbolic structure to human lives both at the intimate levels of dwelling and the worldly levels of institution, whether they're educational, health, culture or law. But at its best, architecture perhaps performs a few other ways. And, and this is what I'd like to explore later in the, pavilion, in the exhibitions. Um, and what... So what we can see, for example, in the Art Biennale, uh, and this is an example of the Australian artist Patricia Piccinini, um, in her um, exhibit called We Are Family, is this sort of... This is a kind of an eruption of the real. What are we? Are we humans? Are we animal? What is normal? Uh, what constitutes a family? Are these little creatures, no matter how grotesque they are, also cute because they are bubbers, babies? So there's a sort of a kind of a, a, a questioning by erupting our normal, our normative ideas with um, these new possibilities. And this is why I was um, kind of curious... Um, at myself, really, because I went through this um, exhibition um, in the main pavilion 
in the Giardini, which is sort of like the core of the Venice Biennale. Um, and, and this um, exhibition was, as soon as you enter beyond the thematic kind of space, which is a void, and then there's this exhibition. And this is what it was. And I, I was, I was um, thinking, oh my goodness, this is awful. Why have I come to the Venice Biennale? What, what is going on? And it, is, um, this, it was this sort of pathetic little things. And I went around fixing them up because they'd all fallen or that way or this way. And they were just these pathetic little photocopies on a bit of cardboard um, along the wall. And, and I thought, oh, gee, most of our students, even those that fail, do better than this. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, what is going on? So there's this really interesting um, kind of shock of the banal, I have to say. That's what I called it, the shock of the banal. Um, and um, this pathetic... Um, exhibit and, and then and yet a month later it was the one that I could remember so then I thought why why is this the memorable exhibit and, and that's why I've sort of I guess tried to explore the Venice Biennale through this idea of the real so the real in psychoanalysis is defined as an eruption that breaks through reality sometimes the actual and literal occurrence that is traumatic because it disrupts the flow of reality. It is very different to reality, imagined or concrete. Sometimes it is captured in moments when you're going about your ordinary business and that ordinariness kind of breaks up. The example that is often given in psychoanalysis is when you stub your toe or when you break your mother's vase. Horror, terror. Um, it is a situation when you sometimes literally hit the real, they say in psychoanalysis. It therefore has the effect of stunning the person into a different reality from the one that they were going about. Not going about our ordinary business, but tending to our poor little toe or limping or packing up the pieces of the broken vase and hiding them somewhere, I don't know. Um, so it is that... Um, uh, that sort of eruption of something that breaks through what you expect. Now, certainly, the last thing I expected at the Venice Biennale is this pathetic kind of exhibition, given that now they even have curators for their exhibitions. I thought, are they serious? This is embarrassing. The lack of effort was palpable. And I thought, was it the last minute? But then I thought, well, how can this be the central exhibition in the main exhibition space? So, um, so then the question is, what is the work of architecture? And so what um, I discovered is that uh, the work of Solano Benitez, whose exhibition this was, was called Breaking the Siege. Um, and, and you can see there that in addition to those little thing, photocopies, there was this structure, this parabolic structure of this triangular kind of system. And because what he, what he um, kind of, in, well, not invented, but used, I suppose, is um, two things. One is the um, two... Two, most, two of the most abundant resources in the world, bricks and unskilled labour. So in Parag Paraguay, apparently, there's nothing but bricks. Most architects see that as a constraint. But he um, instead thought, well, what do I do about this? So what he did is design a structural approach that allows building using unskilled lab labour. Um, so therefore, you know, in, this is the opposite to, um, well, it's not the opposite, but what happens in developing countries is that construction industry keeps the unemployment low. Labour-intensive systems. Labour is cheap. There's a lot of labour in construction, um, 
industry. The downside has always been the quality, the design and the architecture. So Benitez, it is argued, uses design to decouple the quality from unskilled labour. And so what he has done um, is a, a very counterintuitive thing, simply pouring mortar, this is the first thing he did, in between the bricks placed on the ground. So he actually made panels, in other words, instead of having to lay the bricks. And sometimes he folded bricks into a three-dimensional self-supporting system. So he designed a kind of structure in which the bricks could be inserted. And thirdly, um, he used bricks as, um, I don't understand this bit, as nerves in handmade stereometric slabs. I don't know. James, do you know what that means? I didn't see that bit. But nonetheless, the buildings were phenomenal. Now, this is just one of them. Huge number of buildings, all pretty amazing designs, all built out of bricks and unskilled labour. So did the guy think, well, I can't be bothered with this biennale, I'm just going to show a few pictures of my work? I don't know. But architecture, while the exhibition stunned me about the real of the pathetic exhibition, the architecture was um, obviously protecting, as he has argued, um, Paraguay from the trauma of the real. Because the trauma of the real, he says, are one million inhabitants per week with only $10,000 per family that move from rural areas into the cities. And he says, okay, if we don't... Um, we, we, we can um, either ignore this or do something about it. Um, but if we don't do so, people will not stop coming into the cities. They will come anyhow, but will live in appalling conditions. So what can we do? So in a way, his project protects Paraguay from the very real of people living in um, squalor. Now... Similarly, there were, um, in the 2014 Venice Biennale, Cool House's idea of elements, room after room of the main exhibition displayed uh, door handles and so forth. But I have to say that um, this was very impressive at first, but then incredibly excessive um, and a little bit, I was dumbfounded and exhausted after seeing yet another door handle pinned up on the wall. But it did ask the question, what is our um, work about? Um, and in one of the rooms, um, Cool House had a whole wall of uh, trade journals from the 1960s. I think he's going through a sort of um, uh, middle age nostalgia period, or post-Middle Age. Um, but on the other wall, he, there was projected, if you like, a film. And this film um, was about, had extracted hundreds of um, little sections of um, known films, well-known films, that had very memorable entry and exit scenes. So in other words, the door. Because... Uh, some rooms showed door handles, other rooms showed doors, others showed windows and window frames, others showed cornices, ceilings, you name it, architraves. There were room after room of these um, uh, elements, uh, hardware and so forth. And, but in this particular, on this particular wall, there was the, this um, looped film of all the memorable entry and exit scenes from well-known films. Suddenly, the humble door was shown as an element that could, uh, that could um, open up a real and reveal a shocking or embarrassing situation. It's a, the door can be an element that masks very ordinary lives and hides them. It announces the arrival of an intimate someone or a stranger. In other words, the door resonated with literature, art and meaning. So 
Between these two things, that tension, if you like, between the imaginary of the door in literature and the symbolic of the door in trade literature, you know, the question was, what is our architectural practice? Does it have as much to do with the banality of the specification of the door handle as the dramatic role of the actual door in the lives of people? Similarly, um, Studio Mumbai showed all the elements in the fair practice as real things on shelves. So they had real tiles, real uh, render, real paint, and so forth. So this idea of the um, realness entered, if you like, the, the Venice Biennale, Biennale the uh, facade sections, the stone. So they had a real section of a window, for example, and, and a wall. And it produced a very weighty presence to the um, ex exhibition and engaged the viewers in a very corporeal way. Okay, now recently what has happened is that um, many of the themes, so each Biennale there is a director and the director announces a theme. And recently there has been themes that are very much about trauma or crisis or some kind of problem um, in relation to either internally to architecture as a discipline or architecture's relation with the rest of the world. And so this is interesting because in a way we could say that these themes are exploring some kind of closeness of the real, that, the, that architecture is not protecting us from the real as much as perhaps they would like it to. So even though the real is impossible, it continues um, uh, to influence throughout our uh, adult life, to influence both the imaginary and the symbolic throughout our adult lives. Since, since it is the rock against which all our fantasies and uh, linguistic structures ultimately fail. The real, for example, continues to er erupt whenever we are made to acknowledge the materiality of our existence, i.e. illness, death, and so forth, um, usually perceived as traumatic. But there's also all those joyful moments like birth and um, and you know, pregnancy and so forth. So the real works in tension with the imaginary and the symbolic. Now, you know, the um, so the recent, the most recent Biennale was a, called "Reporting from the Front," and um, Aravina has spoken about um, the the uh, Maria Riker, who's an archaeologist who went to South American desert and took a letter with her, um, the, the and took the letter because she wanted to see the patterns of uh, certain geological formations and she couldn't see them from the ground perspective. So she would get up on her ladder and look at it from there. So Aravina is, ask, uh, is arguing that what are the new views and viewpoints for architecture and can we do something like Maria Riker? But interestingly, he does point out that she didn't take um, you know, a four-wheel truck because that would have ruined the patterns um, and, uh, and so forth. So this very delicate way of having a new viewpoint. But reporting from the front has been perceived as trying to respond to all the problems um, that architecture has not solved in the world. And interestingly, similarly, um, Burdett, Richard Burdett in 2006 had this question of society and architecture. What is the relationship? David Chipperfield in 2012 had the theme of common ground in order to mend the fracture. The crux is to mend the fracture between architecture and civil society. Fuxas in 2000 had the theme of less aesthetics, more ethics, arguing that there needs to be um, 
some way of addressing the new social discontent and disparity and, and so forth. There's been several, if you like, of this idea that uh, architecture has not yet solved all the world's problems. And therefore, it indicates, in a sense, that the Venice Biennale is perhaps saying the things that we as architects and in the architectural pro profession do not say. We don't talk about those things. We don't, you know, people go about their daily business of making a really good building. They don't think, oh my goodness, there's a whole bunch of people in, um, in um, Central Australia that are kind of living in, in terrible conditions or something like that. Very few. So there, there is this really interesting thing that perhaps the Venice Biennale is not being the real, but is pointing to it, in a sense. Um, or what I will try to argue is at least preserving the impossibility of the real, whereas perhaps the rest of reality is not. So this is also Cool House's thing. He wanted to go back to fundamentals of architecture and he wanted to talk about architecture, not architects. And he wanted to look at this idea of the last 100 years. In other words, history. Um, so there's, it's unusual that someone like Cool House wants to look at history. And in fact, in a way, that Venice Biennale was, I thought, the one that we should send all our students because it was so educational. I learned so much at that Venice Biennale because it was going over all the last 100 years and what had happened and what is architecture um, if you look at it uh, in that way. But it was very researched, informative, and in some ways it was the most boring one for that reason. Um, and whereas um, I thought... Um, and I just like Sajim, I suppose, I'm biased, but this one was a bit different. It was way more optimistic uh, about architecture and the theme people meet in architecture was, people have argued it's about bringing architecture back to experience. I would say it's about bringing architecture back to how it stages um, this sort of relationships and so forth. So I just want to now move through some of the exhibits. And um, now, one of the interesting things is this idea of one to one exhibits. So, in this one, but you know, this is one of my favourite ones that I've seen in the last three Biennales. Um, it's very, very simple uh, in, in its final effect. And it's called Blueprint. So therefore it plays on the idea of, a, of a, um, the old-fashioned blueprint uh, plans of architects. But it, it's only about the artist's three houses, that uh, one he lives in and the others that he remembers. Um, so the, the top one is the current house he lives in, the, so the one on the, the ceiling. And you can see how everything is... Um, constructed or fabricated from this uh, beautiful blue shimmery fabric. And the bottom is the, the, a print of the house in um, Korea. And, uh, <clears throat> and it was this soft rubber uh, base and many people I saw started to take their shoes off before they walked on it. So there was a sense of kind of entering, if you like, a different kind of uh, space. But, you know, it takes a lot of work to put these things up. And to, so the conceptualization is in itself very inventive, but then the crafting and the construction of it is um, beyond that again. The, um, this one was very interesting because it spoke about, in a sense, the ephemeral nature of planning. We often think of planning as set in policy and so forth, but how many plans have never been realised? And this uh, really interesting machinery was um, in the Israeli exhibition. 
Um, it showed how um, sometimes plans are just like lines in a sand. And so this machine would draw the plan and then erase it and then draw another plan and so forth. This one was um, fascinating because it used this time-lapse thing of just what you would call Soviet realism and turned it into this magnificent... Um, uh, what's it called, kaleidoscope in the ceiling. So therefore it presented, if you like, a new form of uh, ornamentation um, that, that moved, that was cinematic. There, there, I've got a film there, but um, I don't think I've got time to play it. Mm -hmm. So, so there was this time lapse between what was happening on the wall and then you would get the kaleidoscope version of it on the ceiling. So there was this sort of loopy thing um, going on. So, then you, what, so what you got was sort of reality, photographic reality, and then this sort of um, mediated imagery, this sort of uh, flow of imagery. So you remember the tulips and now they're, yeah, that's it. The music was interesting. All right. Now, I, I did have some that I, I had a pet hate for. Um, and and um, some of those uh, tried to solve uh, social problems. Um, and, and I know many of you will like this one, and it's very controversial for me to say this, but I really disliked it, and I couldn't figure out why. I found it very irritating, even though the guy sat me down and explained it to me for a whole hour and a half. Uh, so it was uh, sort of... He, he really knew what he was doing in that sense, but um, um, I, I, I don't know, um, and I've tried to think about it. But they make certain claims that, um, so they say that not only is there a crisis of housing, so the word crisis reappears and reappears in, in this uh, Yithi's Biennale as it did in those other few that I mentioned. Um, uh, so he says not only a crisis of housing but a crisis of how we live. And so they've proposed this, uh, what I called um, a fanciful idea that if you live for in a place for our... So they had these sort of various versions of dwelling and very clever in many ways. But why did I like it? I tried to think about it. And I think it's because I thought it was a, a designer version of Big Brother and reality TV and me don't mix. The seduction, I thought, of not making any decisions. We are in an era of heightened super-reality. Um, supra-reality, maybe. The heightened sense of reality is, of course, evident in reality TV, a genre of representation that most of us often use as ordinary people, so therefore not actors, actresses, to produce programs that are supposedly ordinary. But I don't know whether the torturing survival uh, shows with mothers saying they wanted to show their children that she could do this and puts herself through some horrendous course of physical torment is hardly ordinary. And no, it's not like washing the dishes. Um, but uh, the agenda is thus to stimulate um, ordinariness, but this is far from what it actually does. There is nothing ordinary about Master Chef, who has the kind of kitchen, who, I mean, who has that kind of kitchen and who makes those kinds of meals on an ordinary daily basis? Not me. No, do you guys do that? Um, but more importantly, why are we so seduced by the competitive infrastructure of ordinary people competing in extraordinary practices and environments? I'm not suggesting for a moment that there should not be competition, but to locate that competition amongst amateur cooks, for example, is both to undermine and to displace and even evict the profession of chefs uh, from their role in society. And this is most accentuated, I believe, in the renovation and design 
and architecture reality TV programs. Architects and architecture are evicted from this reality. We do not play a role in reality TV. Um, it also illustrates that to understand the real is to rethink what um, some of you may have heard of is the simulacrum of Baudrillard. This idea that the world is only a copy, an imitation, a representation, and this will eventually substitute any actual world of um, whatever, professions, experience, and the rest. The world of simulacrum extends itself beyond reality TV, of course, because it becomes the paradigm of how we actually live. This can be observed in the um, kind of growth and proliferation of selfies. One recent observation when I was in Paris and I was walking through the island uh, where Notre Dame is, um, and of course there are kilometre long queues of tourists to go inside the Notre Dame and I have to say I'm glad I was a tourist before tourists became accessible to the whole world. Um, but one colleague, Kevin, had said to me, go to the tip of the island and look at the structure near the river. And so I did, which meant that I had to go to the rear of Notre Dame. And in fact, that structure was close. But at the same time, the rear of Notre Dame, I think, is the, really the most beautiful part. And at that moment, a group of tourists, and this was a large group of what I thought were a family um, or friends, and, and family and friends, but they were there taking selfies, each one individually, of themselves with Notre Dame Ria in the back. So no one took a photo of anyone else. They each one took a selfie at the same time. Um, and so what is left of Baudrillard's simulacrum? It's either a long queue at the end of which you enter the real Notre Dame because it is in the guidebook, or a selfie of only yourself with various backgrounds of famous monuments um, and so forth. So um, I do think that this particular pavilion had the kind of scent to me of um, reality TV and selfie as a designer kind of version of it. Other projects that were trying to solve social problems were a little bit different. This one, for example, tried to make order out of the mess of this very dense urban environment. This one, for example, um, really was very, it, it was focused on specificity. It focused on particular individual and their livelihood and how this um, strange location in South Africa where the freeway, proposed freeway was partly built, then abandoned, then kind of forgotten, and what could they do with it to, to transform it from the most um, dangerous and criminal area into, into something more livable? And so the architects went about um, uh, looking at what actually goes on that is non-criminal um, in that area and built on that. And that was by looking at individual people. And I suppose that's the other thing about this one. It was very abstract. They were saying it was about everyone, but I felt like, you know, in the last pavilion, which was decades, there was a sort of a communal bed. And I thought, well, I'm not going to sleep in that. Um, so who was it about? Who was it for? I don't know. Now, this one was very interesting, too, because it, um, it was um, arguing that um, development can provide um, multiple <coughs> programs and... Um, it, um, it, it was a game, and I spent a long time here because I kept playing with these little, little, must be a gambler in my past life. I kept playing with these little metal balls. interesting about that is that um, they had designed this quite interesting, as you can see there in the photograph, a very large, large development, but they had designed these sort of sloping ramps 
and had programmed them in these sort of multiple potential programs. And what the little game showed is even if you started from the same place, you might not end up in the same place in the um, development. So there were all various routes that you could take. And every time you came to an intersection as a little metal ball, you had to decide whether to go that way or the other way and so forth. So there was this sense of chance and um, possibility in, in the multiple program. Now, like the um, month and uh, decades pavilion, this one was one that I also didn't like at all. And I especially was shocked that it was awarded the golden lion for the best national pavilion. And it was the um, Kingdom of Bahrain. And they had these, um, they actually transported these fishermen's huts from Bahrain to Venice. It cost a fortune. And I imagine not only 10 times the cost of the hut itself, but probably 1 million times the cost of the hut itself. And the, um, they described it as architecture without architects. Um, huge finances. Um, and some Bahrainis are deeply concerned about the sea in which their island is located. And what was especially interesting is that they gave sweets to people as they arrived. And because you get so exhausted walking through this Venice Biennale, you want to sit down somewhere. So people actually rested in these fishermen's huts. So that ir irritated me even more. Um, because uh, what, what was because one of uh, oh uh, one group of that's because my students are cleverer than me. One group of students have analysed um, Bahrain and the um, island and their relationship to the water, and Bahrain has grown many fold because of reclamation of land in, in the water. And so in contrast to the um, huts, this is really what Bahrain is like and what people desire. And what these students have found is that um, uh, amongst many other things, this is just one of the things that they found, but this is uh, how many tonnes um, of rock has been uh, uh, displaced in order to reclaim the land. So the actions and realities are testimony to a very different history of oil, urban development and land reclamation, making the we that the um, exhibit talked about very confusing, more contradiction. It's an exhibit that is a trace of a lament for a romanticised past that possibly did not ever exist. And the problematic representation of others might have been overlooked um, if a different poetics was proposed for a different future. However, the proposal is for a new waterfront strategy, the one that you've just seen, um, a, a fashionable global economy of cultural tourism. How and whether such fishermen's huts would ever feature or survive in this new agenda is not explored in the exhibition. The huts have become by default artefacts in a museum announcing the end of their spontaneous construction. So why, why is this the most dangerous project in my uh, perception? First, it got awarded by what I considered intelligent people, including Sujima. Um, secondly, I think what it does is displace the real from ever even being considered as an um, important part of how we uh, perceive ourselves in the world. So the effect is we are in an era where we distance ourselves from reality by substituting for it, in other words, the huts were a substitute for, for the reality, which is the islands. But then we disavow the impossibility of the real by eluding its disruptive aspect or eruptive aspect. In other words, we 
sedate the real, in, in a sense, um, by believing that nothing will ever happen. There will never be um, a kind of a, a tsunami that takes over those islands. There will never be an earthquake. There will never be, none of those buildings will ever fall down. We have, by looking at the fishermen's huts as this romantic idea, we have substituted that hut for, in fact, the real, which is much more traumatic, potentially. So here, the, um, the, there is no um, trauma. Trauma is eluded. In contrast, there's other projects that dealt with ecology. So the ecological question was an important one, but in a very different way. So, for example, this, this one was about um, a waste dump that had now, that coexisted with a natural park and was now re-stored, re, um, if you like, as an agricultural system. So the idea of farming and agriculture is, I think, a very interesting phenomena that we hardly ever consider in architecture. Um, and I'm just... How long have I got? I don't know. Okay. My God. Um, uh, so the, the other pavilions provided a sort of commentary. One was the, the current uh, one from uh, the Netherlands, which really asked the question, if there's all these United Nations um, sort of settlements, why can we not work as architects with them to try and um, make their border zones more permeable so they can actually have a role in the local community in addition to being closed off as sort of United Nations islands in another context? So this, I think, was a very interesting commentary on kind of um, something that's already going on and how can architects intervene in that energy, if you like, or in that kind of um, practice in order to shift the agenda from defence into kind of civil society. This one was very interesting because it provided um, a really uh, three examples of projects, but it, it, it had these, see those two balls with the um, pivoting thing. Now, people were, people just bypassed this one because you had to actually ask someone to help you pull that lever down in order to get the, the exhibition going, and no one would do that. So the, 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 the person that designed this exhibition was a bit forceful, if you like, on the audience, but one of the guide people said to me, I'll help you. And then, of course, as soon as that people started seeing us, they all wanted to do it. And so then it became this thing. But what, what it did, so there was this phenomenal machinery about a few images. But I think that was sort of part of it. So it got us to do labour and work together as a team in order... And, and, of course, it showed the design approach, then the uh, policy, then the inhabitants and occupants in... in um, the, so there is that machinery. It's very heavy, and you feel like you're breaking it when you pull the levers. The Japan exhibition in 2014, interestingly, talked about the bubble economy and how... So the question there is, how does architecture participate, if you like, in what else is going on in the world? And, um, and what it... Um, showed, in a sense, was that the whole practice from Japan was uh, shifted due to the bubble economy, and that is, in fact, when a whole lot of Japanese architects did international projects and um, uh, headed by Kenzo Tange. So there was a... a so they mapped all this. They, they kind of uh, generated, if you like, a, a background or an interactive field within which architecture participates. And also the research of um, what was being researched. And you can see Australia. I thought, gee, Australia's a bit left out of those um, networks there. Um, but interestingly, they actually showed original blueprints of work. And um, one of the things that they showed is a whole lot of rural 
structures. Uh, rural environmentalism uh, apparently had a, a big day in um, Japan in the 1970s. Now, I thought this is one of my most interesting ones as a commentary one because what it did is set up itself as, a, as an exhibition that then put forward strange juxtapositions. In other words, it put forward the Venice Biennale with a trade fair. Is it very different or is it similar? Is it similar to people just trying to sell their wares, um, a trade fair of whatever? Is the Venice Biennale any different to that? It put the juxtaposition architecture and real estate. Is architecture different to property value? It put the juxtaposition family and aspirations, and in fact it, they did this amazing mosaic of a very, very happy family and made a kind of um, uh, out of, out of um, ownership, out of house ownership. It put also the past as, um, as a kind of a series of um, hardware that you can get off the shelf, that you can purchase off the shelf. So these sort of um, uh, elements from the past are hardware that you can purchase off the shelf. So it actually put forward a kind of real questions about um, where we are with, um, there's some of the examples there, um, with, with these um, contrasts and, contra and, and um, juxtapositions. And I think often we put those aside and don't think about them. At the same time, the other commentary that was going on was, um, was that during the, this is the 2014 Biennale, I think, no, 2010, um, there were interviews with the architects that, had, that were showing their work. And these were recorded and then you could view them simultaneously as you went also to see the exhibition. So you saw the architect, you saw the exhibition, and then you heard the interview. So it was this sort of instant gratification from the media. Now, I'm going to skip through these ones, but there is a lot about nationalism, and I thought the most radical one was the Arab modernisms. Fundamentalists and other Arab, this is in Cool Houses, Biennale. Um, I thought, very interesting title. And, and then the other one was this African one, which showed famous things that was going on in the world of architecture and then what was going on in the local community alongside that. So contemporaneous, we often forget about that. Um, one of my favourite ones is this one and um, you, you will you probably know why, um, but it was the um, Dutch exhibition in 2010 which documented all the empty buildings in the um, Netherlands and, um, and, you know, did this exhibition in order to put forward to the Dutch government, we have, and, and it documented all of them, and this is how many there are. An entire city of empty buildings, beautiful, many of them post-industrial sort of um, structures. And so then the question was, uh, there is so much unused architecture in the Netherlands, why do we need to build anything new? That was the question. But what was fascinating about this is the level of, meticulous level of documentation and representation of these. So it did actually document nearly every one of them, as you can see there. But then it also, for each one, it actually found out some sort of coordinates and produced this encyclopedia about each one of those buildings. And so there's this idea of mapping and documenting that can actually generate new innovative ideas. So mapping and documenting isn't only a kind of a historical exercise. It can be the platform on which new ideas are generated. And of course, then there was the physicality of building every one of those um, empty buildings and, and didn't, doing it very simply, just with this, um, uh, what's called polystyrene stuff. And this is what inspired our vacant Geelong project 
except that we have the opposite problem. Um, in a sense, we don't have a whole bunch, uh, we don't have the crisis of housing. We, we perceive that we have this vast open space, but nonetheless, a place like Geelong is um, in a crisis in terms of its identity, in terms of its reorienting what it's about from an industrial kind of uh, city to, um, to what is the question. And so this photograph, for example, is of the Ford building in 1925. And so we called, so our idea of vacant is as much that industry made Geelong as a kind of inhabited place because when Ford arrived it was empty, an empty field and um, similarly with other industries. And so we, we, um, we have explored this with students doing um, thesis through this sort of creative research uh, approach and we did have an exhibition a few weeks ago. Um, some of you, I don't know, some of you may have gone to that. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip that one too, although I, what I like about this one, this was recognised as an exhibition in 2006, and what I like about it is that it, um, it is from a small country, the country that I was born in, Republic of Macedonia, and instead of talking about itself and trying to present its best foot, if you like, put its best foot forward. It actually discussed architecture as a discipline and I think offered something that is relevant for all uh, architects and, and, and the discipline of architecture rather than discussing itself. And what it offered was this, that um, a place like Scorpio, and I imagine there's many other places like this, um, is often perceived as this two-kilometre square city, especially after Kenzo Tange's um, master plan of Skopje after the earthquake. Um, so there's this sort of trauma that created Skopje, the earthquake. But it has become something else. And what it has become, their argument, was um, worlds. So there's these small... So it starts off with one world, it becomes a kind of a, a square city, but then when you go inside that city, what you find are these small worlds. And so the question then was, how can we um, attend to the particularities of these worlds and the mul multiplicity of all these possible worlds within the city, rather than either trying to unify it in, in this way, or trying to make it a geometric kind of ordered thing in that way. In other words, how can we address the, the kind of the, uh, the um, particularities of the uh, fragments within the city um, in, in, um, in many cities around the world? So from world to city to worlds, plural, multiple, um, and, and also, and they, they were recognised, I think, also because of that very interesting concept, but then also that they presented their exhibition with white chalk on a blackboard, in addition to, of course, the model of these uh, parts. Now, the real buildings. So, the only pavilion worth talking about that's in the Venice Biennale is the <laughs> Nordic Pavilion, the Sverfen Nordic Pavilion, and this is it here. It is the one that you cannot um, uh, kind of not keep going back to. You keep going back to it because it's quite striking. Um, and this was a photograph in 2010, and you can see how it is designed, see that tree there, and then these three trees here. So they were planted, obviously, for the pavilion. So there's something that it's saying about um, trees and uh, buildings. Um, interestingly, in the current exhibition, 
the trees were kind of covered over by this uh, very massive structure. And um, at first I thought, oh my goodness, how could they do that? Um, this is the core of this pavilion. But in fact, it was very interesting because what it did was generate some other way of both perceiving the pavilion but also interacting. So what you found, quite spontaneously, people climbed up on, on this um, pyramid, very, very heavy timber structure, and ended up having conversations up there near the ceiling because we, you, know, you would sit down, there were these little pamphlets, those colored things that you can see, and it was called in therapy. Um, so you would sit down and have a little conversation. And of course, I ended up having conversations with other Australian people about the Australian pavilion um, because that's what everyone wanted to talk about. This is the Australian pavilion in 2010, one, the opening of it, of the exhibition. And this is the, Australian, the new Australian pavilion. Um, now, I do have to say, um, I haven't thought about it enough, but... It, it, it is um, a little disappointing um, in that it is on now a very prominent site right on the canal. It is a black box um, which could have been elegant but for some reason doesn't quite hit the mark that DCM buildings usually hit. It starts to look a little bit heavy um, on that site, and the blackness of it, I don't know, it's already wearing, there's already wear and tear, it's just been finished. Um, so there's something expedient, let's say, about it um, that is not quite up to the mark of the DCM buildings usually. But it is not nearly as disappointing as the exhibit. The exhibit, if any of you have read any of the commentary, it's about the pool. It is so abstract and kind of just does not resonate with anything, even about the pool and the role the pool might have played in Australian culture. But it argues it's about culture and identity and, and so forth. Um, it is a really empty site. So this is the one, one of the problems, I think, with it is that it did not translate the pool from the pool that some of us might have experienced in our childhood to an exhibition about the pool. It just put a pool there. Um, so there was no kind of nothing, no mediation, no translation, no resonance, no richness. So, you know, you saw the photograph, fantastic. I'd love to swim in that pool on the left, but what are you going to do in this one and why, what is it doing there? So there was a kind of a, a voidness, a, a void of where something might have triggered richness or, or at least um, resonated with our experiences both horrific and pleasurable in the pool when we were children, but no, it didn't do that. In contrast, a pavilion that did touch what I want to um, mention. I haven't got long to go. Are you with me still or are you falling asleep? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> um, no, I'll skip over a little bit of it. Um, but the one that did do that is the Japanese pavilion. And part of the reason it did do this is because it was kind of the design architectural version of a doll's house. Um, and what you found was children could look into it, but all of the rest of us, even if we're small, had to bend down and kind of peer through it and so forth. But why is this one successful? And I think it's because of what I uh, want to uh, mention now, and that is the mirror stage in psychoanalytic theory. Um, so we've already mentioned that the subject is a split subject, but what happens is that at a certain time as an infant, the, the child stumbles upon a mirror. 
she is suddenly bombarded with an image of herself as whole, a total image in the mirror, whereas she previously experienced existence only as a fragmented entity, you know, parts of herself. She could see her hand, you know, she could see, um, you know, her legs and whatever, you know. So not until the infant stumbles across a mirror do they see an image of themselves as a whole, as a totality, as a total in it, in entity. Um, so this image of wholeness um, is in, interesting because it's coming from an external force. It's outside. It's outside of the actual person. The mirror is not the actual person. So that in a sense, the mirror st stage in psychoanalytic theory is this sense of the complete image of the self that appears in the mirror, and this counteracts the infant's primordial sense of a fragmented body. So at first, there's this jubilant assumption, oh, wow, look at me, uh, you know, poke around in the mirror and so forth. However, the image, and, and you see this image of coherence, but the process and the reason that the subject is called a split subject in addition to the imaginary and the symbolic is that the internal self cannot reconcile itself with its external image in the mirror because, um, and, and it is the first encounter with human subjectivity. And it is the first encounter, and this is important for us as architects, of spatial relations with the idea that there is the self and then there is something else. But the split is, and the lack of reconciliation is due to the fact that you are only total in the image of yourself. You cannot, and that is separate from you, yourself, your body. And there is that tension between the total image and the um, actual self. And that tension is what... Um, the um, imaginary and the symbolic split subject um, endures for the rest of their life. But the interesting thing of the doll's house is not only its amazing scale, scale and its meticulous replica of little books with their names and so forth, you know, the Japanese, how they go into all these little details, but also where it was located. So there is a hole in the floor of the Japanese pavilion and the that this um, doll's house was inserted in this hole so that half of it was underneath and half of it was above the floor. So that you could, as you can see here, you could also go up there and there was a little stool and you could put your head and then everyone would look at your head amongst, giant head amongst all these little um, furniture and so forth upstairs. So there was a real play of chi child play in, in this. I think in a similar except way that what uh, this sort of, uh, the Toyo Ito little thumbnail models, you know, pressing stuff with his thumbs, was a sort of a similar child play process of the design of this, um, of the uh, Taichung Metropolitan Opera House in, in these, um, in, in the Toyo Ito pavilion. And I think similar also was this way of providing these screened interiors with drawings around on the box but peering into the, the intimate and secret lives of others. And so finally, I, I want to end with two things. One is education. Uh, because I think that... <clears throat> Lost the piece. Uh, there was a very interesting exhibit in the 2014 Biennale on radical pedagogy, put together by Beatrice Colomina, and um, it, it really pointed to the very significant role that education has played in the discipline of architecture. And I think, so I'm coming back to this question in the real world. Um, this idea that education is somehow what you do um, in order to get to the real world is a little, um, a little problematic, I think. Um, and this exhibition pointed out to how, in fact, many major movements were generated, even, for example, 
Elvin Bioski in the uh, Architecture uh, Association, the AA, were generated from and within education. And, um, and uh, I will find the section in a minute. Um, and I think one of the things that perhaps we, um, we are at risk of is um, students not being real students. Students, in a way, not at the fault of students, but in the system and, um, you know, academics not being real academics and so forth. Um, in the system, it's as though we are driven to get through that as quickly as possible, get that done over and done with, and get to the real thing. But I have to say that we are therefore at risk of completely eluding the real if we go about trying to immerse ourselves only in reality. We end up becoming, in a sense, like a reality TV show. Our, our, um, our lives pass us by, whether they're as a student or as an architect, almost as a reality TV show. And um, so we are familiar with, this, with the phrase of the real world um, and perception that the world of students, of being a student in u university, is not the real world. The problem with this is that it has led to the phenomena that students are not real students and professors are not real either. Not that I think this is, should not be a different world. It should be a different world, precisely because Ven Venice Biennale is also different from the architectural profession. Um, and, and nor do I think that this is the fault of students, but yet with students not wanting to be the students, it risks all the issues of our supra-reality. Being a student goes some way also to preserving the impossibility of the real and also kind of appreciating the eruption of the real. Now, I won't talk about this exhibition, which was in fact an exhibition of student work. And there's a little anecdote, but I won't, I'll talk about it maybe later on. But it's an exhibition of student work at the Venice Biennale because students need to learn something about architecture in order to meet in architecture. If you, we don't learn anything about architecture, we can only meet in reality. We cannot meet in architecture. And the theme was uh, Sajima's theme, people meet in architecture. So, um, so what are the risks? So these are the final two slides. Now, what risk is there? What risk could there possibly in the Venice Biennale? Well, um, Ishigami spent days putting up something that was invisible to me and everyone kept saying, oh, wow, isn't that fantastic? And I kept thinking, what? I can't see anything. Um, and, and it was these um, threads. I don't What are they made of? I've forgotten. Um, these fine threads, almost invisible thread, threads um, that kind of were holding themselves up. Nothing else was holding them up. So it was a structure of threads. And he and his team were there for days trying to make... It's quite a big structure because that's the arsenale. And that is... You can see the person, the scale. So it went up the top and down the sides and in space. Um, and everyone was fascinated and looking at it, and, and I kept thinking, so what? You know, I don't get it. Um, because I'm a bit, you know, thick, I suppose. I'm, I'd like to see things, real things, bricks. Give me bricks. Um, anyway, then they nearly had it ready, and it broke. And then you would see them 
for days in a corner crying. And I thought, what, what, is, what has just happened? It's just a few threads that broke. But it was, in a sense, the eruption of the real. Um, this thing that they had put so much effort into, the effort that we saw was the construction of it, but the research and the conceptualization of it and all the rest of it was part of that effort. They did win the award, though, even though it failed. This is a kind of a lesson for students. Even though you fail, you might get an award. <laughs> no, not an award from us. An award of having gone, taken that risk and gone through that process. The only thing that disappointed me, and you can see they were, look, they were using these moulds to do things, I don't know what, because there was nothing curvy about this. You can see it there. Can you see it? The, the lines, that's all it was. The, so I don't know what these are doing. But, um, but the only disappointing thing, and I've only recently heard this from our last real speaker, oh no, no from um, Hide, who was here, is that apparently he's an awful person. He's an awful person. He's awful to his staff. He probably made them cry. Changes the story, I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, that's the end of it. Thank you. <laughs>